in a fairly recent video, I took apart a kinetic switch, one that was actually powered by the energy of the switch toggling, and it transmitted a code to a, a remote control receiver. And I thought, well, let's take a look at what else is available, particularly let's see what the cheapest is. And I was expecting them to be fake. I was expecting it to be battery controlled. So I ordered this one. Let me show you. It's described as 433 megahertz remote control switch, 12 volt receiver and kinetic round RF transmitter. Uh, £12.47. I actually paid less than that. They've put the price up. This is what sometimes happens. So I arrived and I was thinking, well, is this going to be battery operated? And I clicked it and it, well, you, it didn't even operate there. This is one of the quirks of it. It feels like an ordinary switch, like one of these battery operated remote controls, but it does actually work. And it, it's really, it doesn't feel anything like the other one. So I opened it thinking this was going to be just a, a battery tucked inside. It turns out there is not a battery. Let me show you what's inside this. It's different, very different to the other one. It's what I thought the other one was going to be and was kind of surprised to find out it was magnetic. Not just the magnetic, but I've discovered since that it may be kind of based on a old dynamite blaster control, a clicker. Let's see if I can actually get this out without destroying it. The front button locks in. Oh, this is not coming out easily. I'll have another go. It locks in a crystal, a piezoelectric crystal disc. Now, the reason it felt like a standard tactile button is that in the middle of this piezoelectric disc is indeed a tactile button. It's just the dome. It's not actually doing anything electrical. All it's doing is striking the crystal. So if I lift this out, I shall try poking it out from the back. It's best bet. It's kind of stuffed in quite tightly. Hold on. This is not easy to get out. So inside is a brass disc. The brass disc has a layer of the crystal piezoelectric material with a metallization on one side. And normally these are used as sounders and transducers. Your smoke detector probably has one of these. It creates a loud peeping noise. Uh, because if you apply electricity across this, it will distort, but it works in the opposite direction as well. When you actually squeeze the crystal, it actually generates power as well. It's not generating anything. It's not doing anything at all at the moment. Probably broken it, but that's all right. We shall work on that. Oh, I know what it is. Um, it, uh, it's the fact I'm not supporting the edges. Let's say uh, that's better. That's kind of one of the secrets. So these things are also used as sensors, these discs. You'll find them in the electronic drums. You'll find them in vandal-proof metal buttons where it's got one of these discs stuck to the back of the button and when you push the button, it doesn't move. It just basically responds. Whatever you, you're activating happens when you press the hard metal front of the button. That's kind of the same technology. And the idea is that uh, this uh, piezoelectric crystal, I believe the put it in a heated oven and they bring it up above its Curie temperature and they apply a voltage across it and then cool, cool it down again. And once it goes below the Curie temperature, it kind of stores that uh, sort of electrical charge, so to speak, that charge state. And that's the secret of it. It works. It's a bit quirky, but it works. We shall explore this. We shall take the circuitry apart. But first thing that's worth, worth noting here, I'll zoom back out again. The remote control that came with it, I've labelled it kinetic receiver because I don't want to mix them up, even though it isn't a clear box. It looks very similar to the other circuits, but there's no active circuitry. There's not even a processor on the main board here. The little RF receiver board seems to be dedicated to this task and it has a microcontroller on it and also this sort of little receiver chip and it is decoding the pulse. And if you try programming it to this receiver it doesn't work program it incidentally to uh if you want to toggle it independently you can just push the button in this and you can toggle it on and off if you want to clear this completely press it down and hold it down until it goes on and then it goes off and then on again then let it go and it clears the codes to program in the new uh, button with this and it has to be one of these type of buttons 
let me just sit this back in because it ain't going to program in if I can't click it. You press and hold the button until that light lights on the circuit board. Once it lights, you click this a couple of times until it registers it, and that's it, registered again. It will not learn other remotes. It is purely, it's one of these things, because these are sending out a tiny burst of code, and these ones send out a continuous code as long as they're pressed, this receiver will not work with this, and this standard receiver will not work with this button here. So I'm going to take a picture of this, and I'm going to reverse engineer it, and then we'll uh, explore the circuitry in further detail. Okay, let's start with the back of the circuit board. We have a row of connections at one side, and we have a very few interconnection tracks. The bulk of the back is test points and uh, a ground plane with a random pepper pot of holes all over it. I'm guessing the reason for the random placement of the holes is that if they had them in a regular grid in a ground plane, there's a risk that it could have an effect on an RF frequency. But some of the test points are things like ground, uh, the RF supply voltage, the data and the clock for the actual RF chip and ground positive and transistor one. The transistor one is particularly interesting. If you look at the main side of the circuit board here, it gets kind of interesting. We have three inputs from the piezoelectric crystal. The only two are used, the AC1, AC2 and a COM. I get the feeling that it's designed to take a stack of crystals so that if they may be played safe. Maybe it's if they get a lower output crystal or a smaller ear of crystal, they can stack them. But uh, they have the facility for three connections. Possibly there's crystal on both sides of the brass disc, not sure. But they feed what is effectively a three-phase bridge rectifier. It's got three pairs of diodes. You'll see this later on in the circuitry. Uh, there's a Zener diode to cap it to 5 volts. There's a transistor for shunting purposes. A couple of capacitors, including this little 2.2 microfarad capacitor and this, I'm, I'm guessing, 100 nano. Mystery microcontroller, which doesn't really have much to identify it. And then the RF section here, which is based around this little 99K1 chip. Uh, a resonator. And then a series of capacitors and inductors leading to the output for filtering to put out the exact correct frequency, I'm guessing. Let's take a look at the circuitry. So the input from the crystal goes to can go to any of these pins because they're all the same. They're these uh, dual diode packages, what they're called, they are called KL4. I shall write that on it three times. KL4. Dual diode packages, they've simply used those because it was cheaper than using two full bridge rectifiers to get that six diode arrangement. It means that if you, I put a question mark here, it means there could be another crystal in there. It means that no matter what's connected where, positive will always go up to the positive rail and negative will always go down to the negative rail. That generates a peak five volt supply. I say peak 5 volts because there's a W9 Zener diode which would theoretically cap at around about 5 volts. I thought initially that this device here was going to be something fancy, this C645. I thought it looks like a transistor, but it might be some fancy 4.5 volt regulator. I think it's a transistor. And for a very odd reason. Uh, then it goes to the power goes to the microcontroller. And the microcontroller then switches power uh, to the RF module. I've more or less covered everything here on the fact that the microcontroller can switch on this transistor. If it does, it shunts the supply rails. And I'm guessing this might be to um, an option. I don't know if it's actually using it. I'm going to use the oscilloscope on this to actually see what the output is. But I'm guessing that after it's done its business and said, you know, transmit that code, it may actually deliberately short these rails to get them down to the point of the processor goes into a reset state and then drops that line to the transistor. Uh, and that would be it ready for the next press the button that would charge up. I get the feeling from looking at the way it works that it's not getting it's not getting a dedicated signal from these. It's purely looking at the voltage rising up when you push the button to detect that a button's been pressed. And because you're going to get two humps when you press that button, the click in and the click out, it's got a timer. The first one it can detect that the voltage goes above the threshold that it can actually do its business. 
it will transmit the code, but then it holds off for a timer. And that's why when I was clicking it repeatedly, the load was just going on, off, on, off, no matter how fast I clicked it, because it seems to be that timer. The microcontroller only has one other one other uh, notable feature. It's got a 2.7 mega ohm resistor and a capacitor that looks as though it may be an external oscillator um, or timing circuit in some way. I shall show you the uh, RF circuitry. So the RF circuitry has three connections. You've got the RF positive switched by the microcontroller. It's got the zero volts and it's got the data in. The first thing it hits is this cluster, tight cluster of capacitors here that are all just basically in parallel across between the RF positive and the zero volt rail. It has a chip called a 99K1, which is connected with a negative. Uh, pin one is the crystal or resonator. Pin two is negative. Uh, pin three is data in. Pin four is a clock test point out, not actually using the circuit. It's purely going through to a test point on the other side. Then pin five is the output and pin six is the positive going up to the uh, that switched positive rail. Then the output has a little inductor, capacitor, inductor, capacitor to the zero volt rail, inductor, capacitor, zero volt rail, and capacitor for that fine filtering to make sure that what goes out is just that specific frequency, I guess, derived from this crystal. What is the crystal? The crystal is labelled 26 megahertz. 26 megahertz. So it's possible that these will, unless it divi it might divide it down, but these will probably be tuned to round about the desired transmitting frequency and then it's going to lock to this uh, 26 megahertz crystal. OK, I'm going to set, I'm going to take the circuit board out of this. I'm going to solder some stuff in the back and then I'm going to get a little tiny Seed Studio oscilloscope in, not a sponsor. And we shall probe that and we'll see what we can actually find happening on this circuit board on the voltage rail. One moment, please. OK, here's what we've got. This is a typical trace of a button press. It starts off with the voltage down at zero. This is the zero voltage level here. It causes a spike that goes right up to about four volts. When it hits four volts, it suddenly clamps down. That's it sending the data pulse. But then it seems to clamp down to roughly about 1.5 volts. And then at that point, it just tails off from there. And as far as I can see, if I pump the button here, it seems to get up to that voltage threshold. And you'll see, see those spikes that are dropping there. I shall try and capture some of them. Those spikes are a code being transmitted in a really short spike of data, and then that transistor being switched on, which then shunts the supply down to the here, and uh, normally it would just tail off from that point because you'd press the button and released it. Because I was pumping it there, it then builds the voltage up. As soon as it exceeds about 4 volts, it does that thing. It will send a pulse of data, and then it will use that transistor to shunt the supply down till the point the processor itself resets, which is about one and a half volts. Uh, interesting things. Strange. The actual duration of the data pulse is tiny. It's minute. I'm just going to keep smash the button here. Little, uh, little bursts of data. And then I'm going to sponge it again just to see if it uh, cuts down like that. Yeah, it does. Very strange. But that's a... Uh, I'll, I'll switch back over to the drawing now and we can take a look at it. So what's happening here is that when that crystal is deflected, either as that solid click or me just pressing it, just pumping it without actually necessarily clicking it, it's producing current that then gets directed to these rails. And the voltage across here rises. It's got a marked at 5 volt peak. I think that Zener diode is a last resort. I don't think it's ever going to come into play. Because it appears to the microcontroller that is actually monitoring for that voltage, and as soon as it exceeds 4 volts, its nose has got enough charge to actually send out the signal. And it will then send out that burst of... Uh, it will enable the RF energy and then send the data to the uh, RF transmitter. And then after that, by the look of it, 
Either that's going to take a pulse and drag the supply rail down, or it's this transistor that's being brought into place. And I did uh, monitor the lead to that transistor, and it does. You see a very, very sharp spike on this line, so it definitely is firing this transistor after it's done that. Presumably that's just so it goes down to a known level. And then ultimately it's going to uh, wait for that voltage to exceed that higher level again. I wonder then if it's transmitting on each of those pulses and it's the receiver that is ignoring all the other uh, pulses. It may be the receiver, it might be transmitting a series of those uh, bursts of data, but the receiver is actually the one that's filtering it to the switch on and off because I didn't see anything really obvious here other than the voltage rising up and then dropping down. And it does look, uh, when I press the button, as though it transmits uh, data on each one. I'm just going to check that. One moment, please. Yeah. That is transmitting every time the button is pressed. It's the receiver that's doing that timing and filtering. So this thing really is, it's basically, it's building up that voltage. It's getting the, reaching its threshold voltage and then it's sending a pulse of data and then it's shunting itself back down to the, the sort of near the zero volt rail again. So all ready for the next one. Very intriguing. So, uh, right, I'll just put that stuff out the side. One moment, please. So in summary, this thing is a piezoelectric power button. It's using those, uh, it's got the option for those multiple sections of it. It's got basically three outputs, but it's only using two. And it looks like a standard piezo disc. The one thing is, it's not putting out a huge amount of energy. I tried it from different positions in the house, and I have to say that I only got reliable operation of that little neon uh, lightning bolt uh, on the bench here when this was in line of sight in the room. If I took it through to other rooms, it's very hit or miss whether I actually managed to transmit a code to it or not. And for that reason, I have to say that even though this is quite nice, even though it's not got a battery, even though the concept's quite nice, I still think that I would rather have one of the battery-operated buttons because uh, it's not only more compatible, it's compatible with all the random other re remote receivers, whereas this one really isn't. But... Um, it's just the battery is going to last in most instances ages. It gives you just so much more choice. But it's certainly interesting how they've done this. It's, you know, we, what we can take from this is that, you know, for our own projects, we can use that multiple diode arrangement where the a piezoelectric device can be rectified and used to power rails. And in this case, uh, where it was used to actually power the processor, it's really neat that once a rather than actually risk that dying down voltage actually causing issues with processor stability, it basically, it did its, it la launched its payload and then shunted down to that known level. I've never seen that done before. Very odd, very unusual. But um, yeah, that was interesting. It was well worth getting and taking apart. That's us seeing the magnetic kinetic switch and now we've seen the piezoelectric one. Oh, and before MD asks if... Piezoelectric crystals can be used to generate power from pavements by walking on them. That's been thought of before. It's not a great idea. The crystals can only take so much flexing and stressing. They're not really rugged for that because there have been solar freaking roadways types of scenarios where people have thought they could get the piezoelectric crystal and, and generate power with just people walking along the pavement. It's not that easy. It's been thought about. It's been tried. It was a failure. But uh, this was an interesting approach. It certainly works, but it doesn't work as well as a traditional battery-operated remote.